Hey everybody, welcome to session 87 of the Behavioral Observations Podcast. Today's episode features a return appearance by Dr. Merrill Winston from the Professional Crisis Management Association. We're going to capitalize on Merrill's expertise and explore the challenges of working with individuals who engage in unsafe behavior, particularly in the context of physical management procedures such as escorts, protective holds, and seclusion. One thing I'd like to point out is that both Merrill and I have many years experience working with individuals with significant and sometimes dangerous behavioral challenges. As such, it's possible that to some listeners, we might come off as overly clinical or even glib in our discussion. If that's the case with you, I'd like to take a moment to assure you that we take these issues very seriously, and we hope that our discussion provides a level of nuance and possibly sophistication that's often missing when people discuss the physical management of unsafe behavior. We have a few sponsors for today's episode. The first one is ABA Desk. ABA Desk is a BCBA-made data collection system that supports frequency, duration, interval recording, task analysis, and trials programs. Visit abadesk.com and use the promo code MCPODCAST to get half off your first three months of data collection and graphing services. We're also brought to you by Behavior University. If you're like me and recertify at the end of June and you still have a few CEs to knock out, then head on over to behavioruniversity.com forward slash observations where you'll save 10% on all courses and webinars. We'll hear more from our sponsors later on in the podcast, but let's get to today's interview. So without any further delay, please enjoy this conversation with Dr. Merrill Winston. Welcome to the Behavioral Observations Podcast, stimulating talk for today's behavior analysts. Now, here's your host, Matt Sicoria. Dr. Merrill Winston, thank you for coming back on the Behavioral Observations Podcast. How are you doing today? Very good. How are you doing, Matt? I am doing fine. And as we I suppose, teased at the end of our last episode. If you're listening to this and you haven't caught Merrill's first episode, it was a very, very popular one at that and uh, where we dive deep into Merrill's kind of conceptual work in mass shootings. But here we are talking about your day job with PCMA. And we're going to get back into, well, we can talk about what PCMA is and things like that. But the general gist here is that we are going to take a deep dive today into uh, restraints and other types of emergency procedures, if you will. And, uh, you know, one of the things that is uh, awesome about having the audience that I have, Merrill, is that when I put the call for questions out, I just got bombarded with all sorts of great, <laughs> great ones here. So yeah. this is going to be a, a fairly listener-directed interview uh, because many times they're the same, same questions that they wrote in to me Mm -hmm. uh, that were the same questions that I had planned on asking. So, uh, mm -hmm. I, so think of this as like a virtual hot seat, if you will. So yes. are, are you ready? I am ready. All right. All right. Very cool. Um, before we get into that though, um, anything, I know you, when you f came on a, a while back, uh, you were, you, you, you kind of were on a, a, uh, a new media flurry, if you will. You're on the behavioral observations podcast, of course, and you were on, uh, the uh, the controversial exchange with our our, our mutual buddies uh, Dimitri and Ryan and things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, you you've taken on a, a uh, almost a leadership role within one of the ABA Facebook groups. If you uh, of, of at least being the you know uh, one of the funnier contributors to that. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, are people uh, stopping yeah. you in the airport and like uh, with with this newfound recognition and uh, you know the celebrity or? Uh, no, no, that's, that's not happening. Um, not signing autographs. I don't think it's, uh, I'm not appearing, um, on Jimmy Fallon tonight oh. or Oprah. So, okay. um, but when I do, uh, then I'll, I'll bring up behavioral observations podcast for sure. All right. All right. Uh, don't, but, don't, don't but, leave out our friends either. So, uh, <laughs> uh, very cool. So, all right. So let's, let's get into it. I, the, so the first question I, I have is a very simple one or it's simply stated, probably more challenging to answer, perhaps, is uh, how how do you define restraint? Yeah, for me, it's pretty easy. Um, I, now, there are gray areas, but just let's just have a general thing that a general 
um, uh, statement to go with. And I, I, the human language, uh, our language is contextual and things have their meaning based on the conditions under which people utter words. And one of the problems with restraint is people utter that word under all sorts of conditions. And under some conditions, they will call an action restraint. And under other conditions, they will call the same action something else. So let's just keep that in mind as we're going forward, this context notion. But the one that I use is it is um, you are in physical contact with someone in some manner, and uh, they are actively resisting your physical contact. So one way that we look at restraint, and it kind of is, it's, it's, I'm not being politically correct, it's just the way we speak about it. We speak in PCM, in professional crisis management in the system, we speak about restraint as a physical prompt. Now, why would I call it that? Well. For one, it's a physical prompt to stop hitting you, to stop hitting yourself, because verbal prompts are ineffective. And it is a physical prompt, but it is a physical prompt with tremendous resistance on the part of the learner, right? Now, there's other physical prompts that have almost no resistance on the part of the learner. Then there's another set of physical prompts that have a little bit of resistance, okay? Um, whether someone chooses to call it restraint or not really depends upon their bias, their political agenda, the arena where they work, and a bunch of other factors. So the average person, just to, you know, to, to explain this a little better, if the average person sees a staff member in a school that has a kid by the hand, and they're trying to get them to write, is the example I use. If the kid is allowing you to manipulate his hand and smiling and in a generally good mood and being cooperative, then most people would just call it hand over hand guidance. Now, if the teaching looks like this, no, Meryl, we're writing now, and I'm, I'm trying to pull my hand away from the table, and you're trying to pull my hand toward the table, right? That's all you're doing. You're just trying to pull my hand toward the table, but I'm trying to pull my hand back. At that moment, I, ha I no longer have free access to my own body. I no longer have free access to move the way I wish to move. And the teacher is, whether you call it restraint or not, that teacher is limiting my movement against my will. So that's where the resistance part comes in. It's, a, it's against the will of the learner. It's not with their cooperation, right? And so that falls uh, under the, the umbrella of restraint? Or is um, it getting closer it, it, to it? Uh, here's, what I, here's what I say. It's all physical prompting. Whether you choose to call it restraint depends on a number of factors, and it's not that clean. So, you, you know, the guideline I give is this. If the person is resisting, but it's ounces of pressure, ounces of pull, so if you had a little grammometer or something that could measure force being applied, it would only measure ounces, right? If you're moving the learner's arm and it's requiring pounds of pressure, on your part, I'd say you're, you're coming closer to restraint now. Most people will not recognize it as restraint because it is not being delivered as an immediate emergency consequence of a dangerous behavior. It is being used in the context of a teaching condition where the client is all or the student is already stable. And because of that, most people would not call it restraint. I do. If the, kid, if the kid is clearly struggling against them but not in crisis and the person's just trying to power through the procedure. Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't do this, by the way, and I'm not judging somebody who uses escape extinction right. or something like that. I'm not judging. All I'm saying is if the level of resistance on the part of the learner is requiring you to exert pounds of pressure, it's becoming more restrainty. Right. Okay? So – for me to come out and say, this is restraint, but this isn't, that's just nonsense. And for anybody else who says it, it's also nonsense. It's all physical prompting. The issue is, when it's physical prompting, right after the child smashed his head, everyone's calling it restraint. Even if it's mild, usually. If it's physical prompting in the middle of a teaching procedure, and the kid's just really, really resistant, nobody calls it restraint. I've never somebody write up an incident report because somebody was struggling with a kid trying to get him to put a block in a bucket. 
I see. I never saw the parents sue. Nobody calls in protective services. And you know why? Because no one views it as restraint. You might view it as ugly teaching, maybe, but it, most people don't view it as restraint. But if we just call it what it is without applying a label to it, just using standard nomenclature, we just say it is a physical prompt and the level of resistance is much higher than the average learner. And, and given that information, some people might call it restraint. You know, If the kid has a smile on his face, maybe they won't call it restraint. If the child's crying, maybe they will call it restraint. And my point is, whether or not you call a physical prompt a restraint is reliant upon a number of contextual variables. But like I said, if you just want to go with like a big generic thing, then I'd say, okay, look, if it's ounces of resistant, it's a lot less like restraint and more like a standard physical prompt. If it has pounds and pounds of resistance, it's starting to look and act more like restraint. So that's the way I like to say it. Got it. Got it. You know, I didn't plan on getting to this so quickly, but one of the questions I also have is the, I, I, I'm wondering if the same, I guess, calculus applies to say like helping and the, uh, and I'll use air quotes here that the listener can't see, but helping someone transition from point A to point B, the so-called escort, you know, like, right. I, I know diff- various schools have tried to wordsmith their way around that. Uh, so as to, you know, yeah. um, as, as perhaps to lessen the, 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 the paperwork machine. Uh, the, you know, that, 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 is, that is precisely why they're doing it, I think. All uh, right. I, I don't think it's the only reason. Uh, I'm sorry, did you want to finish something? Well, I, I just, uh, yeah, I was just going to basically finish the question as just say, you know, uh, do you view escorts, if you will, in the same context that you would say that the, yep. the, same, the same way you'd, you'd define a restraint or a, a, the, 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 the pounds per pressure versus ounces yeah, yeah. per pressure of a physical problem. Yeah. Um, uh, in our system, we have what we call transportation, which other people will call escorts, and we have immobilizations. And we even say, and immobilization is done vertically, you're standing and we hold you still standing, or immobilizations can be done lying down, either prone, face down, or horizontal, or, or supine, face up. Now, um, the distinction we make is arbitrary, and we even say this. We say, look, we call one transportation, but frankly, there's a continuum between transportation and immobilization. And in transportation, there's some partial immobilization. So I can move my legs, and I can move my arms a little bit, but I can move my arms freely because if I could, you wouldn't be able to transport me, right? Um, and I can't go backwards. I can only go the way you want me to go. So – there is restraint there. I suspect, I strongly suspect that the reason that they parceled escorts out is because they could immediately obtain a dramatic reduction in restraint use, which is um, playing data games. Right. Okay? Or the other way around, you know, if, if, if tracking those data was a new policy, which I see time to time as school districts try to become more accountable to these uh, uh, um, th- these activities, it, w- it would be a, a way to uh, not reduce, but at least prevent an increase of restraint documentation. Yeah, it would. And for some, it would, it would result in a dramatic reduction. So let's say they had only a small portion of horizontal immobilizations and most of what they did was escorts. Well, then after the definition change, you'll see a dramatic reduction in restraint use. Right. Because right. they're not written up as restraints, and they're not going to send that to the, to the uh, state. Are you in need of continuing education? Well, Behavior University is a BACB-approved continuing ed provider, and their mission is to provide university-quality courses and ABA for new and experienced professionals alike. Their live webinars generally have a limited number of attendees so that the learning experience is highly interactive. And if you can't make the live events, These webinars are recorded and available in Behavior University's CEU library for later viewing. Behavior University also has a 40-hour RBT training. This self-paced course uses a combination of visual presentation, audio lectures, and live video models to teach all areas of the RBT task list. The course is accessible anytime and from anywhere. So if you'd like to learn more, head on over to behavioruniversity.com forward slash observations where you'll find a 10% discount for podcast listeners. Again, 
That's behavioruniversity.com forward slash observations. And thanks for checking them out. Um, so why don't you tell us a little bit about, uh, you know, you, you broached uh, PCMA. Uh, tell us a little bit about the, uh, you know, you mentioned the horizontal and the, I guess, mm-hmm. the vertical types of, of w- ways in which someone could be supported or what have you. Um, tell us just a little bit, if you could take a minute and just describe the uh, curriculum a little, a little bit more um, Yeah, generally. the curriculum, it, it has uh, uh, four components, prevention, de-escalation, crisis intervention, post-crisis intervention. Prevention is more like um, uh, what we try to do in a traditional behavior plan. It's not written as a plan, and it's not meant to substitute as a behavior plan. It's like uh, emergency kinds of procedures you can try, even the non-physical ones. Like in prevention, there's some of the things that people use clinically, but they're not being used based on a functional assessment or data collection. It's just that we give staff members a few tools to use that are kind of broad tools um, that have a chance of helping until a behavior analyst can get in and write a plan. So we like to think of it as like behavioral first aid. It's not, it's not, it's not clinical in the sense of it was based on a formal assessment with a formal plan. It's based loosely on some information about the person and trying a few procedures that we give them to help stabilize them. It's not meant to be treatment. It's meant to provide stabilization until cr- treatment can begin. I see. So, so some, that, some good for what ails your type of uh, strategies. Yeah. So if you raise the general level of reinforcement, which a lot of people do, that would be an example. Raising the general level of reinforcement requires zero analysis, but it may have an impact quickly. So that's there are things like that, not Mm -hmm. exclusively like that, but even the use of praise for appropriate behavior, stuff like that. Um, So that's prevention component. And the idea there is that staff are actively looking for on-task behavior, praising it, reinforcing it, prompting it when they don't see it. And they're kind of like actively trying to make sure people are staying engaged, they have a good reason to do things, et cetera. And the idea in prevention is to keep stable people stable by actively doing things, not by praying that you'll have a good day today. Mm -hmm. So we, you know, we tell staff, you don't just go into action when there's a problem, you go into action when everything's great and, and, and then you do all the difficult things, the difficult teaching, ask the difficult questions, do the difficult tasks. When the person's stable, there's a lot of work to be done when people are stable. So that's prevention. De-escalation is what most people are familiar with. And we use that for what we call non-continuous crisis behaviors. So, uh, or anything less than that. So de-escalation could be used for simple off-task behavior. So I'm looking out the window, I should be looking at you. I'm not necessarily going to go into a crisis, but generally speaking, people who are constantly off task, there's a greater chance they're going to get into some kind of trouble. So what do we do? Part of de-escalation, detecting off task behavior, correcting it, figuring out why they're off task. Are they disinterested? Do they have enough reinforcement? Is the task too hard? Things like that. So we we have the de-escalation section. We also use that for non-continuous behaviors. And one of the reasons is to prevent overuse of restraint, help mitigate it. So as an example, if one student punches another one on the way to his desk, hits him as he walks by and sits down, we don't find that, define that as a crisis. And what we say is restraint is not warranted because the behavior ended as soon as it happened. And unless you have very good information that would suggest that the probability of it happening again quickly is extremely high, then you wouldn't use any physical procedures. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's how we kind of treat that. I want Other to co- exceptions. I want to come back to that caveat in, the, in, in, a, in a moment because I've, I've, sure. I've seen those situations uh, before and it is a kind of a, a gray area. Uh, but uh, but but um, for the time being, what um, uh, w- what does the what does the training look like? I know uh, you've been uh, out and about. I think you you, you were even uh, over in in Europe uh, doing some yeah. training in uh, in France, and I think in Ireland, if uh, uh, Facebook a, a is lot correct, of it, a lot of it looks like this. Like there's a lot of there's a lot of walking during it. Uh-huh. Uh, but uh, not finger walking. Uh, the training is for instructors is a four day, twenty eight hour training. Um, that is kind of split between uh, didactic, the lecture section, and physical procedures. And so we teach the instructors a variety of physical procedures, including transportation, 
um, vertical immobilization and horizontal, which would be laying down on a mat that we use. Um, and that would be basically what the course is. Uh, one of the things that distinguishes us from uh, one of the many things that distinguishes us from other systems is that we require, um, like in the martial arts, uh, many, many repetitions before we say, OK, you've got it. Um, so that's another part of the training is this um, massed practice over and over. And we do part of every day is spent on doing physical procedures so that people have a chance to forget, come back the next day, see what they retained, see what they got wrong, correct it. And that way, by the end, by the time they get to the last day of the training, everything's pretty much perfect, as opposed to bunching all the physical stuff up on the very last day. And then you remember next to nothing. Um, when the training's over. So we call it distributed practice as opposed to mass practice. Mass practice is like cramming for an exam. Hmm. And so uh, how many, I don't know if you have this information off the top of your head, but how many, how, how far reaching is PCMA? How many people are using it? Or, you know, I don't know. If you, um, I, I don't know the especially number the train, of Especially the trainer model, that might be a challenge to answer, but. Uh, uh, I don't know how many users we have uh, total. It's probably around 30,000 practitioners, probably about uh, 1,000 instructors at any given time because we get new ones and then other ones maybe don't get recertified. And we're in most of the states in the U.S., except for a few. And we are also uh, on the island of Guam. Uh, we uh, did a training in Saudi Arabia, but the people are no longer certified. We have a lot of people trained in Ireland. We have a lot of people trained in France. We have um, like one of the, the major behavioral provider in Holland uses us. Uh, we have a couple of instructors in Russia and um, where uh, other countries we're working on um, South America right now as well. And we also are developing in Canada. So those are kind of the big ones right now. We have a couple people in Germany too, I believe. I was going to make a joke about being big in Germany, but uh, that's, uh, uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> we'll, <laughs> we'll leave that for another time. Uh, okay. But <laughs> the, um, I was going to make a, a Hasselhoff reference, but uh, uh, anyway. Oh, right, right. But, um, how, how, do, how do people hear about you from these kind of far-flung locations, or at least far-flung um, to me in my, you know, kind of uh, parochial New England, uh, you know, uh, point of view? Hmm. Some of it's probably just going to the website and doing a search, word of mouth. Uh, sometimes it's because people see me speak at a conference, and then they, they're, in, they're interested in the company I work for. So there's a lot of different reasons. You know, a lot of it's word by word of mouth because we, we, we're, we're doing more in marketing lately. But, you know, historically, we have not spent much on marketing. It's mostly been word of mouth. And a lot of it is from one behavior analyst to another, you know. Um, uh, and not only behavior analysts use us, but many of the people who do use our system are behavior analysts. I see. So I get uh, interact with quite a few of them. All right. Um, do you guys talk about seclusion at all one, the reason i ask is that we got a ton of questions from people in schools yeah i'll be happy to address it i mean we don't we don't teach it in the system but it's not because we don't think it's appropriate it's just um the way things have been going and i'll let you get to whatever question you want to ask but just generally speaking uh fewer and fewer places are allowed to use seclusion right right and and it's it's unfortunate. Uh, they are um, they I call it uh, uh, clinical handcuffs. People are clinically handcuffing us, um, and sometimes it's done by non clinicians, and sometimes it's done by other clinicians, um, and sometimes it's done from within our own ranks um, in an effort to reduce restraint. Uh, there are people that uh, sometimes uh, I I think inadvertently cause some other problems. I see. Uh, yeah. Um, let me, uh, yeah, so I've got a couple of questions on seclusion. Uh, and so I'll, I'll just kind of start jumping into some of the, the, yeah. these listener, uh, uh messages oh, that, Matt, that we, Matt, I'm sorry, before you do, do you want me just to give like a, a quick and dirty pros and cons seclusion and restraint? Because neither one is without downsides. Yeah. And they both have, they both have considerable upsides. Yeah. Yeah. Go right ahead. Okay. Um, first of all, neither one is evil. Period. There's, there's, there, 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 that's, they're not evil. People do things in evil ways and people do things for wrong reasons. 
but simply being put in a room by yourself against your will is not inherently evil. Um, and uh, being held by another person is not inherently evil. Um, and uh, before people, just as this preface, everyone, you, me, everyone you know, has been put in seclusion. And it's, been, it's called a crib and it's called a bedroom. And we do this with small infants. We take them when they're getting into problems they shouldn't be. And sometimes we will put them in their crib, in their bedroom, against their will while they're crying and screaming and then shut the door. Let me be clear about this. Those children cannot escape. They're not, they're not supposed to, right? But it's the parent's child. It's not a behavior analyst doing it because of a behavior problem. It's the parent's own child. And because of that, nobody recognizes it as seclusion. But, but you can bet your bottom dollar, it is seclusion. And sometimes it's done for the same reasons we do it. That is, the kid's getting into things and he's endangering himself, sure, right? Sure. Everyone has had this done to them, okay? Uh, almost everybody. Oh, There's yeah. probably exceptions. And, and the but funny, my, the market is expanding for those sorts of things, too, because, like, I just remembering back to when my kids were, uh, you know, little, and there's, like, the pack and play uh, where you, that you can turn into a uh, a, a playpen, a quote unquote a playpen, which j- is a, yeah, yeah, baby jail. Yeah, exactly. Um, uh, there's the exer saucer. There's the uh, the 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 little bungee jumper yeah, thing you hang yeah. from the doorway. Yeah, there's they, all sorts. They, of- they all they all restrict movement. <laughs> and the thing right. is, because the kid's happy, everybody's like, oh, it's great. It's a mechanical it's like, restraint. Yeah, but that what what that brings up is the reason why nobody has an issue with that is because the agent of restraint, the person who is perpetrating it, the agent of restraint is the parent. And when the agent of restraint is the parent, nobody freaks out. If the agent of the restraint is Matt, well, then you're a nasty, nasty person. Okay. If the agent of the restraint is a physician, thank you, doctor. Thank you for restraining my child. Thank you so much. If Matt does it, I'm calling the ethics board on you. All right. And so, you know, the agent is very uh, important in these issues. So first of all, everybody's been restrained. Everybody's been secluded. If your child is about to dart out into the street, you grab him by the wrist. He's been restrained. Now, was he held down by three people for 20 minutes on a mat? No, it's not required. It's a three-year-old. You don't need that level of intervention. Okay, but what about when it's a 33 year old or what about when it's a 12 year old who is already 175 pounds and five foot seven? So, you know, these are the issues, uh, some of them. Now, as far as the upsides and downsides, just real quick. Okay, restraint, highly portable, goes where the person goes. You can use it in an instant. You can stop it in an instant, except for a mat. When we use a horizontal procedure, transportation of vertical immobilization requires no other equipment. You can do it anywhere at any time, okay? Seclusion rooms. First, you have to have one, and it's got to be a correct one. You can't just stick them in any room, right? If you're at the Walmart, there is no seclusion room. If you're out at a public park, there is no seclusion room, okay? So that's another downside of seclusion rooms. They are not portable. Seclusion rooms uh, increase the chances that staff um, might abuse it. That is because this is just a general rule, not a rule, but this is just a general observation. The less effort it requires for someone to, um, intervene, the, the greater the probability of overusing it. So if I can just throw you in a room and slam the door and I don't have to exert myself, I might use it a lot more frequently and I might use it, um, uh, I might use it a lot longer. Now, if I have to exert effort to hold you and it makes me tired and I might get injured while doing it, I I might be less likely to want to do it. I'll probably hold them for less time. And by the way, regardless of how long you want to hold them, you can only hold people so long. Everybody gets worn out, right? Seclusion room, you can keep them there all day. And by the way, that's one of the reasons why people ban them. They are so very afraid of them being used wrong. But when you, this is what most parents don't understand. Parents, if you're listening, I'm speaking to you right now. If I had a child, knowing what happens in schools and places I can't control, hands down, if it was appropriate, I would 100% rather have my child uh, in a seclusion room unless I knew the people restraining them. Why? Almost, almost zero people uh, die in seclusion rooms. One kid in Florida hung himself one time because he wasn't observed properly. And it wasn't a proper seclusion room. But all things being equal, they're much less likely to be injured in a seclusion room 
be, be, have somebody lay on top of them, anything like that. Yet everybody seems to look at seclusion rooms as though they're so, so much worse. Another benefit of seclusion rooms, seclusion rooms don't lose it and get angry at you and do something inappropriate. Any human being can lose it and do something inappropriate, even good people. Like if you get very injured and it's very painful and you got surprised by it, even well-intentioned good staff might do something inappropriate in a split second when they're injured, right? This is not an issue with a seclusion room. Staff with an attitude, um, holding somebody too hard. If you're angry at the person, you might hold them harder than you really need to. Not an issue in seclusion. Now, uh, downside of seclusion, not easy to get people into it. So if somebody doesn't transport well, that is, and this, uh, those of you out in the field, and Matt, you do it too, uh, you know who droppers are. Those are the little kids oh, that yeah. the only thing the only thing they can do to try and defend themselves is drop and hopefully hurt your back. Okay, um, the, so if they drop and they're pretty heavy, you're not getting them into the seclusion room unless you're going to drag them, and that's not dignified. And if if somebody sees you dragging a child, even though it's not technically injurious, it most certainly is undignified. And people are going to make a stink about it, as they should. Like the, I forget what state it was in, but there's video of uh, two teachers dragging a kid by the heels down the hallway on yeah. his back. Yeah, right? you know, someone sent us in a video, and I, I, I did not get a chance to. Uh, I, 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 frankly, wasn't able to put my my hands on it to 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 share it with you. But I, I'm imagining it was probably some ungodly, you know, uh, 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 you know snapshot of of some some something like that where someone's dignity is compromised or when yeah. someone's doing you know or, or either that or implementing a uh, a, a procedure incorrectly or something along right. those lines um uh, the other thing about the seclusion room is not appropriate for obviously people with self-injury so and it's also not appropriate for people who might accidentally injure themselves while they're attempting property destruction that is punching the walls the door of the seclusion room so um, it also requires that a proper seclusion room be constructed, which is would be uh, something padded, because you can't have people in a room where you can't stop them uh, punching hard walls right. or anything like that. Uh, so, you know, and there's certain standards for seclusion rooms, stuff like that. Uh, so, that, you know, could you be injured in a seclusion room? Yes, if you have self-injurious. You could also be injured when they're trying to shut the door. Um, uh, to get you in there because it's very difficult to get the child in or the adult in and get yourself out before they grab you again and shut the door. And I know at least one case where the kid got a broken finger because it got slammed in the door. So that's always a risk. Yeah. Um, you know, is it the greatest risk in the world? No, um, but still it is a risk and it's, it's an injury. So, you know, nothing is without downsides yeah. and everybody, Kid, you know, res- it doesn't matter. Yeah. And kids can also do things in the seclusion room to draw your attention back in, like, uh, fecal dis- smearing, yes, urinating, disrobe, disrobing. Yeah, yeah. I've seen, seen it all. Yeah. Yeah. The other thing is, and depending on what's happening, they can get a lot of attention in seclusion rooms. The other thing is that, uh, and this is another discussion, really, but just real quick. When they say send them to a seclusion room or do a, and we'll address this more if you want, a room clear. Here's one of the problems. When you go into crisis, if the way that they're letting you calm down, right, is to just calm down naturally. Well, hey, everybody calms down naturally eventually. However, that does not teach people self-control. So what you're doing is, is you're giving them a place. Just, I want all the clinicians to think about this just for a moment. I'm not saying you shouldn't do seclusion. It's very appropriate for some things. But this is another one of the downsides I spoke of. And one of the downsides is when you bring people to seclusion, that's where they go to be out of control. Okay? And they can be as out of control as they like. But here's one of the problems. We don't want our people to be out of control. We want them to be in control. And when you send them to a place where they can do whatever they want, they can engage in a lot of movement, they can make a lot of sounds, make a lot of noises, impact things, and it could result in a long episode also. Now, that doesn't, again, it doesn't mean don't use seclusion. If the person's behavior is primarily motivated by physical contact, seclusion is perfect, perfect 
right? And we know some people that their restraints are way too long. And one of the reasons is the kid enjoys all the interaction, all the struggle. I'm not doing math while I'm being restrained. I have the attention of three people for as long as I want while I'm being restrained. And I can hurt them on occasion, and I think it's funny. So for a person who meets that kind of profile, a seclusion room is far more appropriate, and restraint could actually make them worse. And we all know this as behavior analysts. We all know that stimuli are not these static things that affect everyone the same. And one child could be restrained once, and he'll never do what he did again, whether it was used as a punisher or not. He just didn't like not moving. I know other kids that in the middle of the restraint, they're laughing at us, and they're commenting on how we're sweating. Okay, so it's my point is it's not one thing for all people. Right. And this is this is another one of the issues, uh, I think. I see. Um, so I think that took care of quite a bit of the questions on seclusion that 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 kind of pro versus con one aspect of seclusion that a couple of listeners wrote in about is that in one state in particular, and I, I think this is probably true in some others as well, is that seclusion rooms are permissible so long as the door is open or someone's in there with them and which doesn't like of course it's not a sec it's not seclusion it's not seclusion I know, anymore i but know they it, call it open door seclusion but i mean if you're gonna have a modifier to put on the word seclusion then it just you can do anything i can say well this is called this is called field seclusion i take them to a secluded field secluded away from society and i let them run around the field well <laughs> You're kind of, you know, you're you're making the word seclusion kind of almost useless when you can have 500 types of seclusion. So, you know, that's another thing. And and Matt, I've seen people take it so far. I was involved in one legal case where basically what the attorney for the other side was saying was, if we, if your child is behind, we have these foam mats. They're about up to your chest, right? The staff were simply holding a mat against themselves so that the person wouldn't be kicking them and the person was in a corner and they were just, you know they were trying to kind of keep them corralled and what the attorney argued was that this was seclusion and you know you could make that argument because they're in a space that you're not letting them leave but then i could make the argument that if they're not allowed to leave the classroom if i stand in front of the door and they want to leave i can make the argument that's seclusion they're not secluded from other people but they're secluded from the rest of the school so then you have to get into these definitions of what is and what isn't seclusion now if a child willingly goes if a child begins to masturbate in the classroom and you prompt them not here in the bathroom which is a very common intervention by the way OK, um, they go in the bathroom voluntary and they shut the door. Are they secluded? Well, they are secluded in common language. But did you use a seclusion procedure? No. But are they secluded by other people? Yes. Are they in a space by themselves with the door closed? Yes. Are they there voluntarily? Yes. So one of the distinctions between something being seclusion and just being alone in a room doing your business is, was it, was it your intent? So did you want to, right? So, you know, from a functional aspect for many people, what they get so upset about, they're so upset about a child being in a room by himself. But if it were for the sake of dignity, Matt, they would demand that the child is in a room by himself. What's the difference? In one case, the child's okay with being by himself, and in the other case, he doesn't want to be. And that's the main distinction that people will use. But you have to admit, they're both in a room by themselves, both in seclusion and in the bathroom. And right. by the way, they're both shut door. They're not locked door. They're not locked in, right? So that's the difference. But so many people are like, well, you know, uh, it's, it's the, um, I think the inescapability that causes the problem, not simply that they're in a space by themselves. But... Uh, um, I'm, what was the original um, issue? I may have gotten a feel a little the, bit the, far the field open, from that. The open door Sorry. seclusion oh, slash non-seclusion. Right, right, right. And, and the thing is about the open door, it, that requires the cooperation of the learner. So otherwise, you're going to be doing all sorts of blocking and restraint. And from a behavioral perspective, one, if they stay in the if, if they stay in the seclusion room with a verbal prompt, I would argue that they probably don't need to be there. That's true. Okay. If they will not stay in the room with a verbal prompt, 
then there's only one kind of prompt left, and that would be a physical prompt. And now, if it's a physical prompt, it is likely to be met with resistance. And so probably they're going to be using some form of restraint. Even if it's just for a few seconds, it doesn't matter. They're still going to be trying to push the student back, right? I've even read some language where they called it seclusion if the staff stood in a manner that suggested that the child's egress would be prevented. So like you stand in front of the door like this, but right. you know, they're not trying to get past you, but you're showing them you may not pass. You're being like Gandalf. Okay. That's right. You shall so, not pass. Yes. And for the listener, well, and for the listener, Merrill is, 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 uh, uh, in a, in an assertive posture here in this, uh, uh with a fake staff. A, yes. With a staff. Yeah. <laughs> So. Um, with a fake wizard staff. No, but that's kind of what they're saying. So, you know, when you look at school definitions and, you know, federal definitions and legal definitions and what people sue over, people are not real clear on what seclusion is and what it isn't, first of all. Mm -hmm. That's why they have all these words. Well, it's just, you know, it's seclusion, but it's not seclusion timeout. Seclusion timeout is this. This is just seclusion. There's closed door seclusion. There's locked door seclusion. If it's closed, but it's not locked and you got your foot against it, it's functionally locked, but there's no lock on it. So there's there's all kinds of this business um, going on. So it's I don't even think it's I don't even think there's one standard definition. Right. That this is seclusion because of this, and this isn't seclusion because of that. I, I don't even think that exists. I what, mean, yeah. What, um, I, I have two questions related to that. One would be, um, are you, you've probably reviewed like a gazillion school districts, pol quote unquote, policies on restraint. Um, I know every school, um, uh, at least in my experience, has been made to have them at some point or another. Yeah. Um, have you seen some that are? You've probably seen some that are terrible, but you uh, have you seen ones that are like really, really solid? You know, or, no. Or, or, <laughs> oh man, I was hoping you're gonna say yes, and then I, I then, don't then, think and, I, and then followed by I, I'll share it with you. But uh, I haven't seen any that made me say, "Wow, these are really good." Okay, which is exactly what I would say and how I would say it if I saw that. And I don't ever remember saying that about anyone's policy. Uh, you know, so many of them are just so – they're just so generic. Um, so, uh, no, I have not seen real good ones that this is seclusion and this is not seclusion because of this. So, so related to that, is it possible to write one given it, it, with language that perhaps has to be generic given that it's applicable well, to a wide body of, uh, I, of I th students? I th I think what you have to say first is get general agreement on the different kinds of seclusion and are they useful distinctions. So, okay, should it still even be called seclusion? I don't think it should be. Yeah, and I'm, I'm, I would throw restraint in there as well, you know, in terms of policies yeah, on seclusion. You know, and restraint. I, I think that, that places are going to – I think they're always going to have difficulty in it because people don't exist well in gray areas unless they have good judgment. And if it's going to be done in places with people that don't have good judgment, then they're going to tend to use rules that are a little bit more black and white. Now, any time you use those, it's going to cause problems in the gray areas, and then they need people to come in and make some decisions. So, you know, I, I don't – I have not seen one with the flexibility to say, under most circumstances, this would be considered restraint. But here's some examples where we might do this, and we will not call it restraint, and this is why. So as an example, um, the, feder the, the federal government does this un like uh, incredibly, like they do it, they do it an unbelievable amount. Um, the federal government um, leaves themselves an out for other possibilities. So, and the, so they say things like, you know, well, restraint shall not be used like this. We define restraint as, and so they guess these are not restraint. So if the physician says it has to be, it's not restraint. Now, they are doing not a functional definition, but they're doing an agent-based definition. So they're saying, if Matt Sicoria says you should do it, then it's restraint. If the physician says it, then we're not calling it restraint. You understand? Yeah. So do you understand how problematic this is? Oh, of course, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it's – and I want, I want the listeners to understand this as well. What people are saying is kind of – 
we don't really have a problem with people that can't move. We have a problem with who's doing it and why you're doing it. And we don't like who's doing it. And we don't agree with you as to why you're doing it. And this is why we don't like it. It's not the people who have a, are opposed to restraint or seclusion or any of these things. They're not opposed to the actual act. They're opposed to the context. You know, if the physician says your child has Ebola and we have to put them in a medical seclusion, quarantine, okay? We have to put them in quarantine. They can't leave, right? Even if they want to. And it's, by the way, it's legal and it's against their will. And if it happens to you, they'll do it to you too. They might quarantine you and, and um, uh, restrict you to your home, right? Um, well, that's okay because the doctor said so. But if a behavior analyst said so, then it's not okay, even though functional outcomes are the same. It's who says to do it, and do we agree with their reasons? And if we don't agree with their reasons, we're calling it this thing. If we agree with your reasons, we're going to call it this other thing, which is just complete, I can't curse, bovine excretions. I see. Nicely done. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I wasn't planning to ask about this, but it, since it came up, I, I'm curious. And I remember you talking about this a little bit uh, very briefly in our first interview. So you do do expert witness testimony. Yes. Yeah. Um, are, are, are you comfortable sharing your experiences with sure. that? Um, yeah. So talk to me a little bit about the, a, a typical situation you might be called into and you uh, you know, who, who are you, rep- you know, uh, sure, on whose sure. behalf do you function yeah. on, et, et cetera? And, yeah. yeah. Um, I actually do both sides. And, um, and usually it's who comes to me first. Um, but I'd say it, it wasn't on purpose, but just I counted them up the other day because when you take the witness stand, uh, the attorney on the other side wants to make it look like you're a hired gun to um, defend large organizations. And so I counted up so that when they ask me, you know, Dr. Winston, uh, do you primarily uh, defend these large facilities? I, I would say, well, actually, I do both. And the largest percentage of cases I've done were on the behalf of parents. OK, um, but I do, you know, cl- about six. Uh, the last time I counted it up it was about 65 percent cases that were suing the school or the agency and the other ones were um working for the attorney um who was defending the school and what i do is i'm known as a fact witness so i am not going after schools or going after parents i don't really go after anybody that's what the attorneys do i'm the one who tells them this is correct this is messed up this is so bad they should just fold now and pay you money. Okay, so that's that's and I so uh, supply the attorney with the proper questions to ask during a deposition. So a lot of times, I like to get a hold of. I like the when the attorney gets a hold of me before he or she has done depositions because I can give them much better questions to ask that they do not know to ask. So sometimes I'll guide their question asking so I can get the information that I need kind of indirectly to help them. But I've done both sides. Um, Most uh, not, you know, what used to happen is the first few cases that I did, which was years ago, they all involved significant injuries. One was a fatality. One was a shattered hip. Um, I forget what the other one was. But what's happening now is not only do people sue over an actual injury, which is quite common, people are starting to sue when there is zero injury. They're starting to sue because they are claiming that their child has been traumatized by the restraint. And trauma has become, not that it couldn't happen, but that in the cases in which I've been involved, it did not look like trauma to me. But um, trauma has become the new back injury of the psychological world because one person can say they have it and then some person can say they don't. And they all have pre-existing conditions. That's another thing. So they already had behavior problems before all this happened. But my point is, is that people are now suing not because you, there was a physical injury. They are suing because of an alleged psychological injury. That's happening wow. a lot now. Wow. So even if you do it perfectly, what they might do is because they don't agree with the reasons you did it or they think that you did too many. And by the way, there is no such thing as too many restraint. 
Um, not meaning that you should have a lot of it. That's not what I mean. What I mean is there is no acceptable number. There is no magic number. There could people, people could have their opinions, but you know, when they say, I'll get this question, they'll go, Meryl, this child was restrained a hundred times in a month. Don't you think that's a lot? And what my reply is, it's not a lot for somebody who attempts to smash his head into the floor a hundred times a month. But if it's for someone who only attempts it once a month, then yeah, it's way too many. So, you know, and the other issue is it's not really because if people are asking the same questions, it's it's kind of the wrong question to say it's too or to ask, is it too many restraints? The better question to ask, how long has it been at this level unchanging? That's the critical question. So, you know, if it went from 100 restraints in a month to 20 restraints in a month, right? If somebody said, Meryl, is 20 restraints in a month a lot of restraint? Not for this kid. For this kid, it's few restraints, right? Yeah. So when people ask a question like that, Meryl, isn't 20 restraints in a month? Dr. Winston, don't you think, and the guy asked it just like this, don't you think that 20 restraints in a month is a bit much? And I said, you can't say that out of context. It depends upon the frequency of the behavior of the child. Now, if you ask me, Meryl, do you think 20 restraints a month for 17 months is okay? I would say no, because there's been no change in restraint, which means there's been no change in behavior, which means something's wrong. So, the, the, you understand? And, yeah, yeah, and yeah. I think that's a super important distinction. Uh, um, what, what has functioning in this role as an expert witness kind of taught you, like, has it made you reflect more about the type of work you do or the type of things that we need to improve on as a field? Like, do, in other words, does it provide you a perspective given that you're being exposed to this, these, these cases where, I mean, let's yes. put the trauma piece aside for a second and where there's actual, and focus where there's actual injuries and deaths and things like that. Talk to me about what, what you know, uh, how that experience may or perhaps may not have shaped you as, 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 a, as someone who teaches this stuff for a living? Sure. Um, I think it does a lot. And, uh, you know, one way it shaped me is it uh, makes me really careful about what I say. So uh, for those of you that saw the, uh, the um, my podcast with uh, Ryan and Dimitri on uh, the um, um, on their on their podcast, uh, no cursing in court. So I learned that real quick. Um, uh, other thing I learned is you don't nod in court. Because somebody's writing down everything you say. Uh, the other thing I learned is you don't realize what you're saying until you read a transcript of everything you said. And then you, it, it shapes your professional verbal behavior such that you learn to be extremely careful under the right conditions. You get better at it. Um, and uh, so it's taught me that. It's taught me to keep my composure um, it's taught me to do my homework. Otherwise, you get professionally embarrassed on the stand, which is no fun. Uh, so there's a lot of aside things that I learned. But I think the main things about restraint is I started to learn all the common problems, all the common problems, because you start to see them again, you know? And it's like, oh, this place had the same problems as the last place. They had poor supervision. And this place has the same problem as the last place. Their behavior program it is just not going to be effective. I can tell by reading it. It doesn't reflect an understanding of who the person is. You know, it's like boilerplate, right? And I'd start seeing recurrent themes. I'd see recurrent themes um, between uh, breakdowns in relationship between parents and schools and administration and things like that. Um, I would see problems in uh, fidelity of implementation, problems in oversight, uh, all, all kinds of things like that. So yeah, I've learned an incredible amount as far as um, the kinds of things people sue over, how it's changed over the years a little bit. And um, it's very helpful to me personally for the company and actually for all of the behavior analysts because I'm, I try, we're actually doing this now. We're putting together an administrator's manual for anybody who uses PCM. And this manual is made specifically for administrators. And part of what it covers is how do you minimize litigation? And so all that section comes from my experience doing the expert witnessing stuff. Like here's all the mistakes that all these people made that resulted in them getting sued. 
These few people didn't really make any mistakes, but they got sued anyway. So here's what you have to be careful about. You know, so yeah, so I've learned a, a variety of things through that. It's been extremely, it's it's uh, doing expert witnessing is extremely challenging, and it is both fun and terrifying. <laughs> so. <laughs> I see. I see. Uh, yeah, I, I, I've had to testify not in this particular area, but in other other areas before, and I, I it's definitely if you're not used to it, it's it definitely is frightening. Or, uh, or yeah, can... ah, yeah. It's like you know you're not going to go to jail, but you know it feels like you will, you know, because you know you're in the court. Um, That's right. You so... just hear the Law and Order theme, you know, in the back of your head, right? Bum bum bum. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so th- it's, it, it's kind of interesting, but yeah, I, I think those are, um, so yeah, it has given me, I think it's given me a perspective of, um, even when I write and all behavior analysts should be thinking about this too. Whenever I write anything, anything that's written down in permanent email, a behavior plan, I'm always doing this when I'm writing, how will an attorney someday try and stick this up my butt? Uh, because they're going to try to do that. And by the way, attorneys are not bad people. Attorneys are awesome. They come in very handy to protect you against other attorneys. So nothing wrong with attorneys. That's their job. It's their job to do that. Um, But you have to be ready for that. And so one of the things it taught me is um, where to hedge and be very clear so that if somebody, what I'm thinking is I want to write something that is put together in such a way that someone can't weaponize it and use it against me. Um, and uh, so that's the thing. By the way, quick hint for any behavior analyst that have to write something up for an attorney, write as little as humanly possible. Do not make the mistake of writing as much as you can. That gives them more things to uh, eat away at you with, yes. okay? Chip away. If you wanna make the other attorney really angry, write two pages. I did that once. He goes, this is all you wrote? I go, it was all I needed to. <laughs> and he was visibly upset. I, I've heard that about actually when you're testifying as well. Uh, uh, vocally, Say as little as yeah, possible. Yeah, you answer only the question you, 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 and only elaborate when asked to right. do so. Dr. Winston, do you expect this audience to believe you? Yes. <laughs> Next question, please. <laughs> Next. Yeah, yeah. Uh, um, uh, well, that, that was really enlightening. I, uh, I'm glad we took that little unexpected detour. Um, oh, Matt, be- before – I'm sorry. Before we finish the questions, I just want to make sure that we have a chance for me to just say the little thing about restraint reduction goals. So we can do it now or we can do it later, but I just wanted you to remind me because it's super important. Let's uh, l- let's tease that now and come back to it as we get, uh, as, as we get deeper into okay. the questions. So I'm going to make a the- note. Restraint. Okay. Yeah. Because I, I think – uh, some of the uh, some of the other questions here will 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 probably occasion a lot of that as well. Yeah, I, th- I think they might. Um, but we'll we'll get to that. Right. So thank you. This is like the you know when the evening news and you know they everyone just wants to watch the weather or, or at least here in New England <laughs> they do. Um, perhaps in areas where the weather is kind of perhaps in like the Bay Area of California where the weather is like perfect all the time that they don't. But here in New England we watch the weather a lot and uh, they always tease that as like the last segment of the news for, you know, what, uh, on the rare occasion, I actually watch an evening news program, but I, I uh, hate it when they use the teasers though, where the answer to the question is obviously yes. Like, you know, they always ask these tweezers, like uh, these teasers, like can getting stung by a bee actually make you smarter? Find out at 11. <laughs> right. uh, I mean, and then when you turn at 11, no, it won't make you smarter. It just hurts like well, hell. Why would you think that? Right, um, right. Or they but, tell but, you at 11, I mean, the 28. Always yes. Yeah. It, the answer is always yes, though. You know, the answer is always yes. <laughs> Clearly, everyone knows that. Right. You don't have to is get stung pop- by a yeah. bee to know that. Um, <laughs> so, all right. Let's talk about restraint. Uh, let's continue this kind of restraints in schools. Um, I got... You know, and again, I, I see this in my own work, working with lots of disruptive, uh, you know, kids with disruptive and, and unsafe behaviors in schools. And, and boy, just based on the volume, I, this is just a sampling of some of the questions I got in. Some of the stuff we've covered already, but um, uh, Pernally, um sent in a great question. I think my biggest question is, what is appropriate for a school setting? I'm finding more and more within public schools that restraints are used uh, almost daily, mostly due to lack of training, blah, 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 blah. I'm paraphrasing here, Pernelli, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, I saw it. I saw it. Uh, staff are restraining students due to not having space to bring the student where he or she can be safe. 
Uh, what is ethical for a public school as far as frequency of restraints? And that kind of echoes back to what you said just a minute ago. Yeah. But let me, Pernali, if you will, let me add my own kind of um, um, uh, addendum to your question here is that I, I see this a lot and I'll be working with a kiddo. And it, it, whether it has to do with restraint or not, it usually has to do with the intensity and the frequency of the behavior. And usually yes. it's some exasperated staff member who's, you know, taken a lot of blows across the uh, a span of, of, of weeks and, or longer. And they usually ask the question, is, is this kid appropriate for public school? And usually they're, they're, they're usually asking that question with the goal of okay. me saying uh, no. Yes. And, <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, it's, it's very much begging, leading the witness. Oh, very for, much. Sure, for sure. For uh, sure. But, <laughs> you know, do you do you have a general response to that question in terms yes. of, you know, if a kid's getting um, restrained quite a bit yeah, and, and what is and isn't within the boundary or, or of, of, yeah. of a school setting? Absolutely. Uh, here's what I tell uh, everybody. You can treat anybody anywhere. You can treat anybody anywhere. You can treat anybody anywhere. How much resources do you have? Okay? That's the only thing that matters. That's the only thing that matters. Because it'll ask me, Meryl, do you think this child can be treated at this setting? I go, I could treat him in a department store. How many staff can I have? Th this is the issue. So when they say a school setting, that's, that's not really the best question. The question is... I think a better question would be, do we have the resources at this school, okay, to serve this child? Do we have, and by the way, substitute anything that you like for the word school. Do we have enough resources at this school for this child? Not should that child be in public school. That child is already in public school, and ones worse than him are already in public school. I know teachers that have had their noses broken, their front teeth knocked out, they've been threatened with death, uh, they've been permanently scarred. Um, uh, the teacher with her front teeth knocked out, that was by a six-year-old, by the way, who had butted her. Mm -hmm. Those kids are already in school. Uh, and, you know, one of the things that, and I'll get to the frequency one in a second, although we kind of partly addressed it, but the... Um, uh, anybody can be treated anywhere. It, and it's not really even the magnitude of the, uh, you know, how uh, it has something to do with how dangerous they are, but what are your staff? So if you ask me this, Meryl, can a child who is 17 years old in a public school, 225 pounds, six foot four, can he be safely managed, treated, run the behavior plan in a classroom where the, the heaviest adult weighs 107 pounds and there's three adults, none of the, and it doesn't matter male or female. I'm just going to say small humans. There's three small humans, adults in the class with this Paul Bunyan of a child. Now, if you ask the question, Meryl, do you think this child can be safely treated in this class with these staff? I would say, no, you need larger, stronger staff because he is a larger, stronger person. And as Scotty used to say on the Enterprise, I cannot change the laws of physics, okay? And I can't. And that's why people, you know, they go, Meryl, do you have a special restraint where one staff can safely maintain a person who is five times their physical strength? No, <laughs> okay, no, I can't change the laws of physics. If you have, if you have a child who, in terms of their ability to be injurious, their dangerousness, if you have a child that's very high on the dangerousness scale, right, you're going to need commensurate resources to deal with it. So it's really, I really prefer to reframe a question of should they be in school with a question of what resources do you have at the school? Now, if they say, Merrill, in this school, all we have is one teacher and one para. And I know this person will require at least a three-person procedure if they go into a full-blown crisis. Then we say they can't be really treated here because if they go into crisis, you can't stop them. And if you can't stop them, they're not safe. Yeah. So, you know. That's, that's a good way of framing it. I like that. Um, Jessica writes, uh, we are encouraged to evacuate the class for disruptive students. Uh, and, I, and I am uh, just <laughs> assuming here, Jessica, that it's that you're doing that as an alternative to restraint and seclusion. Um, yeah. 
Uh, so they're be- being encouraged to evacuate a class, uh, even if it's multiple times a day. Ethically, I know I should not put the needs of one student above another. However, eight students' learning is being impaired from regular yes, evacuations. Yes, it is. Um, so the question is, should a restraint be used on the student who's engaging in the maladaptive uh, behavior at that <clears throat> time so that other students will be less affected? Yeah, here's what I say on that. Um, I'm going to give you my take on room clears. Okay. If the student in the room produces a knife and says and makes a threatening motions toward the staff or the students, then a room clear is about the only thing to do and call the school resource officer. And then a room clear is a good thing to do. Okay. If the person can be moved, can be transported, even a short distance just out of the room, then you transport the person out of the room, even though it involves a modicum of restraint and some resistance on their part. And it is disruptive to everything. And there are numerous targets in the room I mean, even if you take everybody out, that's reverse seclusion. That's a, instead of taking seclusion to the kid, I mean, instead of taking the kid to seclusion, you're bringing seclusion to the child. It's the same thing. So if you can't do seclusion, you shouldn't be able to do a room clear. Okay. Now, if they say, well, now the thing is, even if an adult's in there, he is secluded from the other children. So there is some seclusion, I'm making air quotes for the listeners, there is some seclusion going on as far as seclusion from the rest of their classmates, most certainly. So, um, because he's in a room where there nobody else is. Now, he's less secluded if I take him out into a public area, into the hallway, he's just in the main part of the school. He's not with his class, but he's also not in a room anywhere. I could take him outside. So, you know, the point is, is that when someone does this, here's another analogy. And this, I know the behavior analyst with the question, I already agree with her. And yeah, she's right. And it shouldn't be happening for those reasons. And mild restraint, like a transport and escort, is generally much better than doing a room clear. And, and a couple of things about room clears also. One, um, as all behavior analysts should know, although behavior may be maintained by multiple things, and you may have already identified some, new things could always help maintain it. So... Whenever somebody goes into crisis, a number of things happen. So when the, when the child goes into crisis, a whole bunch of things, these things, stop happening. And then a whole bunch of new things start happening, okay? So what stops happening? Instruction, I stop working, the adults stop doing what they're doing, the kids stop doing what they were doing. What starts happening? Uh, there's commotion, people come over to me, they interact with me, they clear the room out. And so any one of these things could be contributing to maintaining the behavior. doesn't mean any of them are, but they could be. And the thing is, a big environmental change is a consequence of my behavior, like the entire room being emptied out. Let's make it bigger. Let's make it even bigger. I'm in a Walmart filled with people, and I start hitting myself, and everyone leaves the Walmart. That's an even bigger change. And by the way, that's not going to happen. So when people are making the arguments to the schools for why it's a bad idea under most circumstances to do a room clear, it's because that's not how society works. And what you're doing is you're making a fantasy land where all the rules of society are different. So in school, if you start punching people and destroying things, we have everybody leave you and let you continue destroying things. In Best Buy, if you do the same thing, You think they're going to have everybody leave Best Buy and let the kid destroy everything? They're calling law enforcement, and law enforcement's going to remove them. I see. That's it. You know, that's that's how it works in the rest of society. Sure. So I want to get back to something we we I guess teased a little while ago. um, Is that the remember what you were saying? You know, if uh, kid A punches kid B on the way to his desk and goes and sits yeah. down and is, and other than that is, is, is it's it, d- non, non continuous aggression. Yeah. Yeah. We don't restrain under those circumstances. And, we don't. And, and then you, you say that, uh, unless we have, uh, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, but let, unless you have good information that suggests the probability of him doing that again is high. Correct. Yeah. Like you already have, it's, it's recurrent. It's recurrent. Yeah. 
I'd like to tell you about a new sponsor we have called ABA Desk. ABA Desk is a BCBA-made data collection system that supports frequency, duration, interval recording, task analysis, and trials programs. ABA Desk updates programs automatically through phases and chaining types. It even activates new targets and lists so learners never lose momentum. ABA Desk is so user-friendly that it can be set up in a day. ABA Desk is also affordable and contract-free, not to mention HIPAA-compliant and mobile-friendly. With ABA Desk, you'll be able to restore balance and spend more time doing what you love, which is changing lives, of course. If you're interested in learning more, go to abadesk.com, and when you go there, use the promo code MCPODCAST to get 50% off your first three months of data collection and graphing services. Be sure to hurry because this offer expires on July 31st, 2019. ABA Desk, shifting the focus back to progress. All right, welcome back, folks. We had a little uh, technical interruption, and hopefully we are back on track now. Um, so let me let me try to make some sense out of the question again uh, that I was struggling with. So let's let's... Uh, let's hit the rewind button, I guess, metaphorically here, and go back to that example you mentioned at the beginning of the show of I get what you call, I guess, non-continuous uh, aggression. So right. uh, 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 student A walks by student B, hits him on the way to his desk, goes and sits down, and as long as he's still sitting down, no restraints necessary under those circumstances because there's no quote-unquote imminent right. danger. Um, and, and then you add a little caveat in that description about... Um, Unless no restraints necessary, unless uh, there's a history of this kind of, I, I'm don't want to put words in your mouth, but intermittent aggression or the yeah. likelihood of aggression's high, uh, despite that brief pause in in responding. Yeah. And, and, and and so my question is, Meryl, is like, what would be, how much information do you need as a clinician to make that determination? Um, uh, do you need a uh, you know in terms of length of history or or, or things the like that? The same amount that you would need to say that you have a trend. Okay. I mean, how do you how do you know when you have a trend? Three data points. So I mean, it, d could you do it with just that three? Maybe part part of what affects it though. It's not. It's. I mean, if it happens reliably, okay, it's happened at least three times the same way. So if you say, okay, we get a student. I'll give you an example. You get a student. Um, I'll give you an example of somebody that we used to restrain just due to precursor behaviors. Okay. So what we did was we interviewed, we did some observations. He had very, very bad, very bad, high magnitude, self-injurious behavior. He only did it once. It was never continuous, never. So what he did was his thing was part of it was seeing blood. So he would knock his head through the window, cut himself, see blood. He's done. He's not going to do it twice. He never does it twice might be weeks before he does it again. But when we interviewed staff, they all said the same thing. Oh, when he's getting ready, Merrill, he starts biting his hand and moaning and spinning in circles and hitting the table. And, and then we watched an episode, right? And the staff, and he did all those things, just like they said. And the staff said, here it comes. I go, here, what comes? They go, he's going to put his head through that glass. And sure enough, he went over to do it before I could even stop him, right? And so here was why we decided to use that information that we had, even though it might not be 100% reliable. Here's why. The consequences of a false negative, we should have used restraint, but we didn't, right? As opposed to a false positive, we did use restraint, but we shouldn't have, mm -hmm. right? The consequences of a false negative is he's going to the hospital. That's the consequence if you're wrong and you did need to restrain. So I'll give you an example. Let's say there's aggression. But it's not particularly dangerous. Like it hurts, right? The kid pinches or he slaps you really hard, but it's an open hand slap. He doesn't punch you in the face. He slaps you on the arm really hard. It hurts and it's aggressive. Okay. And we shouldn't let it continue. Now, if you gave the kid a benefit of a doubt and say, well, the last three times he did this precursor behavior, he, he said Christmas tree. And the last three times he said Christmas tree, he slapped me. Well, if you make a mistake the fourth time, and he says Christmas tree and you're like, yeah, he might not do it. And you're wrong. And he slaps you. No one's going to the hospital for this guy that we worked with who put his head through the window. 
if you're wrong and you didn't intervene and you should have, he's going to the hospital. So what did we do? We err on the side of being a bit more cautious and saying, let's restrain him. Okay. Because if we're wrong, it will be a severe injury. Right. So in that case, his behavior plan said his nickname was Rusty. It's not his actual name. When Rusty starts doing A, B, C, D, immediately use a two person transportation procedure, bring him out to the field away from any windows until he meets the criteria for calm. Okay. So in that case, we intervened before he did anything. But that was because we felt we had reasonably reliable information about precursor behaviors, right? Now, we didn't have the time to test it all out, but we figured we probably should do it this way because there's too much on the line if we're wrong, right? And we also did a mild form of restraint, a milder form. It was just transportation. Um, and what we found is when we got him out really quickly, it was a lot less of a problem and he would, he would stabilize. So that was just one example. There's others where, you know, after you collect, uh, after you look at enough incident reports and it says, gee, every time he says mommy's coming, three seconds later, he throws, it, throws a chair. Or every time he punches someone, he does sit down, but he's up in 30 seconds again, and he punches them again. So we give a definition of continuous, which would be one, two, three, one after the other. However, there are gray areas even with continuous. So someone asked me once, well, Merrill, we had a guy that was doing this. He would punch a staff member once and then drop to the ground. And we know if he drops, he's not touching anybody. There's no crisis. So they step back and they wait, which is good. That's what you should do, right? But they said he keeps doing it, Merrill. And I go, well, how long is he on the ground? Well, he's on the ground for like a few minutes. He catches his breath. And then what happens? He gets up and he punches us again and drops. And I go, how long was this going on? And they go, four hours. I go, okay. I think it's pretty reliable at this point. <laughs> <laughs> and you may wish to consider the following. You know, once Joshua punches you and drops, don't restrain him yet. But if he punches you and drops a second time within a five-minute period, you may wish to consider using transportation procedures, right? And so the thing is, this is what we're talking about. You at least get some data to defend your decision. How much do you need? How comfortable are you with it? I mean, how, how, how certain are you that your behavior plan is what fixed the kid and not something they did with meds if you're not doing an ABAB design? Right. How certain are you? You're not 100%. No. You can't prove it beyond a reasonable doubt, right? You can't prove this beyond a reasonable doubt either, but it's prudent. It's prudent. Right. So, you know, it does require some judgment for sure. Well, I like that false positive, false negative analysis. That's a really nice way of, of sorting that out. Let me ask you a question that, that uh, bugs a lot of people. Um, where the behavior perhaps involves proper destruction okay and climbing on stuff as opposed to like self-injury or sure. or physical aggression things that are i guess things that perhaps might be indirectly unsafe uh and i know there's a continuum of proper destruction one like if someone's ripping yes, up a piece yes, of paper yes. that's nothing to, to really you know get get too excited about whereas I, if someone's smashing you know yes smart boards that's you know obviously a, that's a, different that's different right. Uh, or if someone's climbing on, I, I see this all the time. People climbing sure. on like the heaters in school, yep. You know, or climbing up on uh, uh, furniture and things like that. Right. So you know, for these kinds of things, um, specifically climbing on stuff, it's not restraint per se, but you're going to have to grab them and exert force and pull and pull them down or remove them in some manner. It's physical contact. It's not what we would call a traditional restraint. So. You know, it, this is more of um, what we would call like a non-crisis safety issue. So, you know, you would probably use something that's far less intrusive, invasive, like a simple transportation procedure or just grabbing at the wrist or something like that just to get a hold of them to remove them. But you're not going to then immobilize them if they're not in crisis. So one issue is there's an element of danger involved. But it's not really continuous aggression, continuous self-injury. We use the criteria of continuous high magnitude property destruction. But even when you say high magnitude, you have to give examples and non-examples. So here's what we do in the class. We say, okay, this is what I mean by low magnitude um, property destruction. I get angry 
and I rip up my work. I get angry and I pull a single poster off the wall. I get angry and I throw a tater tot. Okay. Now I get angry and I throw a chair. That's different. So now it is, even if they're not trying to hurt someone, if you throw a chalkboard eraser, that's just naughty. If you throw a chair across the room and it hits somebody, they're going to the hospital. So, you know, that it's kind of an issue, not just dollar amount of what they're destroying, but what's the probability of an of a secondary severe injury? So, again, you know, the kids ripping papers, you can afford to let that go a little bit. The kids throwing one chair after another. I'm sorry. I don't care if it breaks anything. It's dangerous. So, again, we, we would call it high magnitude disruption, by the way. We even include things like, and this has happened, the kid strips all his clothes off, gets up on the table, and starts dancing naked in the middle of the classroom. Another kid in another classroom dropped his pants. This is an elementary school, no less. Uh, dropped his pants, started to have intercourse with a hole in the desk. Right? So is this the kind of thing where you just tell the other children, children, eyes on your own paper. He'll sit down when he's finished. Or Just worry you about a- you. Just worry about you. He's just being him. Uh, he'll finish in a moment. Or, or do you remove the child so that everybody else will not be visually traumatized? And I'm using that word loosely. So, um, you know, th- these are the considerations. And so it's not like we're going to restrain him as a form of punishment. But we might have to physically prompt him in a manner that requires the use of restraint to get him out of where he is. Or if they're climbing. It's a physical prompt to bring them down. Now, you, it's not technically restraint in the sense of um, that I'm trying to immobilize your whole body. I'm simply trying to retrieve you, right? So right. it's no more th- – the average person would not say that a parent is restraining a child. If the child begins climbing something dangerous and the parent goes over and grabs them and pulls them off of it and walks away – No one's calling protective services. Why? Because no one views that as nasty. They view it as necessary, and the kid's going to hurt himself, and even though he doesn't want to go, I'm going to make him go. I'm going to force him to let go, right? I'm going to force him to come out of the street, right? This is – these are things that are acceptable to most people. So I think those are, you know, some of the – some of the things to think about. And in terms of property destruction, we had this ridiculous request by somebody that was like, well – I think if you restrain someone because of property destruction, it sends the message to the child that we think property is more important than you are. And I said, sir, I disagree with you. I think it sends the message. We are not going to allow certain behavior. Just like the message society sends the rest of us when it says we shouldn't murder people or attack them with no cause. Okay, so it's it's the same kind of thing. We are setting limits on the person. We are saying we are not allowing this. We're going to try and intervene as least restrictive as we can, but we're going to stop you. Right. This is something that must be stopped. And so people have to decide. They have to make this decision already. Are we going to say at our school that it's okay to destroy the, the class? Are we going to allow students to destroy our classrooms? Is this okay? And, you know, I, for one, think it's not okay, and the reason why is I don't know many parents that think it's okay for the child to destroy their home. They shouldn't be able to destroy the school either. That's public property. You pay for it, and I pay for it, right? Um, And the parents pay for it. We all pay for it. So, you know, this is kind of one of the issues. And people get up in arms because when they think of us using restraint, Matt, they think we're doing stuff to people as a form of criminal punishment, right? Like I'll get things from people like, why was he restrained? He didn't even know what he did wrong. Well, you're talking about restraint as though we're sending him to prison. And if somebody's going to send you to prison, you need to know what you're being charged with. We're not sending you to prison. We're momentarily arresting your movement. It yeah. doesn't matter if you understand why we did it or why you don't. If the kid's about to run into the street, you don't give the kid a rationale before you grab him by the arm. You grab him by the arm, right? Yep. So this is these are some, uh, I think, of the issues that people have to wrestle with. That is, are we going to say as a school that it's okay to destroy our room? If we're going to say, if we're going to put our foot down and say, no, we will not allow children to destroy classrooms. What are you going to do? We're going to escort them out. 
Are you going to restrain them face down on a mat with three people? No, that's not necessary. We just need to take them to a place where they can't destroy stuff. Perfect. Great. That's what we do. We don't restrain people in the room. We're trying to destroy the room. Get them out of the room. You know, so that's, you know, we don't want to restrain them there. We, we want to remove them. So one issue is, are you removing people? Or are you immobilizing people where they are? You know, that's another issue, too. Mm -hmm. So, you know, property destruction, most of the time, it can be stopped by moving them. You know, but if you don't move them and allow the other issue is a behavioral issue. And that is when you allow people to engage in their problem behavior, destroying stuff, they, get, they come into contact with all the reinforcers maintaining it. Uh, uh, potentially. Oh, so yeah. 100%. I, yeah, I've seen yeah, that for sure. I mean, if I like the sound of things breaking, should you let me break things if I like that sound? So that's another problem. Clinically, it's a bad thing to do for some people. Well, that, that I think someone wrote uh, in, in one of the questions that, uh, you know, this whole concept of last resort. That I'll be happy to address that. Yeah, I, I, I think I it's a big, I, I got a big problem with the phrase. I can't remember who asked it. I think it might have been Josh. Josh, did you answer ask that question? Uh, blah, blah, blah. I, it doesn't matter, but I hear that a lot in schools. Uh, you know, and it, and and it's as a dangerous such, a lot, phrase. It's it yeah, and as such, a lot of uh, I, uh, a lot of dangerous behavior go goes yep. on uh, yep. uninterrupted. Because yeah. it's, cause, so, cause there's no there's no there's no bleeding yet on the part of staff members, you know, or something or some some ridiculous threshold hasn't been met yet. Here, here's my thought on the phrase last resort. Um, it, it's it, it does more harm than good. When you say restraint to the last resort, it, it suggests that you have to make abortive attempts at multiple things. So you're going to try a bunch of stuff first during the crisis before touching them. And what that means is every procedure you try that fails is another opportunity for the person to continue to aggress. So um, this is one of the problems with last resort. What we say is if it's not crisis, it's not that restraint is the last resort. The question is, do you understand what a crisis is? This is the issue. If you understand what a crisis is, the way we define it anyway, continuous aggression. Restraint is not the last resort, Matt. It's the first and only resort. And here's the example I give. If a student, if it's mild, if it's mild aggression, I'm pinching you. I would just probably try redirecting their hand, right? I'm not going to restrain them immediately. Why? If we have a false negative, like I talked about before, I failed to use restraint when I did. The consequences are not severe. I get a little pinch, big deal. So in cases like that, I can, using air quotes, afford to try a couple things first. Now, let me give you another example, very different. A student is smashing his head into the wall as hard as he can. It hits so hard you can hear it from the next classroom. In that situation, restraint is the first and only resort, some form of restraint. Even if it's grabbing the child by the arm and pulling them away from the wall, that's a form of restraint. He doesn't want to leave the wall. He wants to stay there and bang it. You're going to have to make him leave the wall, right? So in that case, restraint is the first and only resort. And, he, and I can make an argument that it would be unethical to not use restraint immediately. Because here's what I've seen. You've probably seen the same thing. I am slapping myself in the face. I am nonverbal. Meryl's hitting himself in the face. What do you think he wants? Well, don't restrain him yet. Let's figure out what he wants. Where's his communication device? I don't know. Slapping, still <laughs> slapping, still slapping. They find it. They bring it over. I'm so agitated now. When they prompt me to use it, I bite them because I'm not a cooperative learner at this point. I'm already angry. I'm already injuring myself, and I'm already in crisis. So they say, uh, oh, uh, maybe he wants a cookie. So they bring me a cookie. I whip it across the room and punch them. Maybe he's thirsty. Let's get him juice. They bring me juice. I smash the glass. Okay. So everything they try, that's another opportunity for me to continue being aggressive. The other thing is they might actually reinforce a long bout of SIB because staff are engaging in the behavior of reinforcer scrolling. Maybe Meryl wants this. Maybe this is bothering him. Then they start to aversive scroll. Maybe he doesn't like this. Maybe we should get rid of this. Maybe Matt should leave the room. Okay. And they start doing all these things, right? And meanwhile, I'm still hitting myself. I can make a very strong argument that that is unethical. When you know, I can immediately make the client stop by restraining them. 
you uh, any other procedure you use is a probabilistic venture. Restraint, I can stop them instantly, 100%. Now, I can't stop them forever, but I can stop them instantly, right? Mm -hmm. Any other procedure you do may or may not do it because it doesn't rely on phys physicality, right? So um, that's why I don't like using the phrase last resort. I start, I like using terminology and definition so that staff know, hey, guys, is this a, and actually, Matt, we're putting this in the new manual. I have a section called, is it a crisis or is it a problem? And it's like, okay, the kid comes up to the teacher, starts cursing a blue streak at her, telling her that she's this, that, and the other, and ugly and bad things. Is this a crisis or a problem? He doesn't have his fist balled up. He's not threatening harm. He's just saying nasty things. And the answer is it's a problem. A kid drops on the floor when it's time to go to art class. He's in the classroom. He just drops to the floor. He's not doing anything dangerous. This is not a crisis. This is a problem. It's a problem, but it's not a crisis. Now, some people try to solve this problem by using physical procedures. And I'm not saying you should never do that. But I am saying that there are a lot of people that use what looks like a restraint for noncompliance. And I'm not saying it never should be done, but I'm saying it should be done carefully. And you probably want to have a good rationale for what you're doing, because one day you might, up getting, you might end up getting sued because somebody disagreed with your rationale. You know, so like I'll give you an example. Kid drops at the bus loop. If I had a quarter for, for every time a kid dropped at the bus loop, I would be retired already. All right. They, they don't want to go into class. They get out of the bus. They drop. And, and staff ask me all the time. Behavior analysts ask me, Meryl, we got a kid dropping at the bus loop. Do you think it's OK for us to use a transportation procedure to get him into class? And I go, well, let me ask you this. How long will he stay there with only verbal prompts? And they go, oh, he stayed there all day before. I go, have a discussion with the parents. Have a discussion with the principal. Um, explain to them what you've tried that didn't work. Explain to them the class time that you're losing. Explain to them that he probably you could get him in there in a couple minutes if you use some mild form of transportation. Explain to them that it's possible that when you put hands on him, he might explode and it might be a full crisis. And everyone should make a decision as to what they'd like to do, you know, and get get buy in from everybody and say, look, do you want your kid to sit at the bus loop for six hours? I don't know any parent that's going to say yes. Right. But and if you say, look, he's not being dangerous, but we've got to get him into class. And once he's in class, we have reinforcement systems in place and he's fine. And I've heard this from many kids. Like once we get him there, Merrill, he's good. But getting him there is a problem. So could that be used as part of a plan, a physical prompt to get up? Yeah. Might some people call it restraint? They might. Is it possible the staff are really mostly using it as a physical prompt because the child's not exploding? Yeah. By the way, that's another issue that would, that's another variable that might affect whether someone calls it restraint or physical prompt. And that is, how does the child accept it? So if the child's like, I'm not going in, and I go, come on, let's go, and I grab him by the hand and I pull up with like a pound of force and the kid gets up, you know, not that much restraint because he didn't have a bad reaction to it. If I grab him by the hand and he explodes, that's a whole different story. So these are the things that have to be, I think, also figured into, are we going to use this for what a condition that somebody else might not agree with? Yeah, that, that's, that, that's helpful. And that kind of answers another question someone had about how to obtain buy-in, but we'll uh, return that in a second. I, right now, I want to get to an awesome question that uh, Alyssa wrote in. Um, uh, she writes, uh, I am the CPI trainer for our company, uh, an awesome company, I'll just add parenthetically, uh, and a portion of my job is uh, also to ensure behavioral health throughout the company. I'm working to create a procedural checklist to use when consulting in public schools to determine if it's safe for our staff yeah. and if it's going to be a good working relationship with regard to crisis management. So this company, uh, um, uh, uh Part of what they do is they place they place staff in schools to work with with kids okay. uh, with with varying needs. Um, do, 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 I'm just trying to go through the rest of. It. So do you do you know if anything's like this? If anything is, um, I guess what she's looking for are there. What should someone look for if? I guess one way I, I would interpret the question is like how can you tell if a school kind of has their act together with regard to. Uh, you know, these types of crisis management, um, I guess, guidelines, procedures, policies, et cetera. 
Um, you know, what sort of things would you be looking for if you were sending staff that you're responsible for into a school setting to see if they'll be supported, uh, you know, if there's a, some sort of crisis event? I, I think that um, I'd want to know, well, the system that they're trained in, first of all, and I'd like to know the level of resistance that they're capable of managing already. That is, what kinds of crisis do you have here now? And how well can you stop it? So that is, I'd like to know, do you already have individuals with challenging behavior who have some dangerous behavior that could hurt staff badly enough to require medical attention, okay, of some form, even if it's just minor? And if they say, Mara, we've never had a kid that injured a staff member that caused them to seek medical attention, then I'd say, oh, you're not dealing with that many difficult kids, really. Or the child had to be given medical attention because of their own behavior, self-injurious, right? So I'd be looking at severity for one, but I'd also be looking at um, the capability of the staff and the willingness of staff. And I'd probably also be looking at the staff mentality toward restraint. Some staff, you know, they're just awesome. They don't mind doing it. They understand that it's needed. They're okay with doing it. They're good at it and they're comfortable doing it. Some staff don't want anything to do with it. They were trained on it. They resent it. I know teachers that say, Meryl, don't take this the wrong way, but I did not go to school to become the police. And I say, I don't blame you. I don't blame you at all, right? Um, but somebody's got to stop this child or he can't be here. So I think that I'd want to know, how does that look at? I'd also want to know, I'd want to know from the principal, how, do, how does the principal support the staff? How does the principal feel about restraint? Does the principal feel it's horrible? Does the principal feel it's necessary? Um, does the principal support the staff? Uh, do staff feel like they're going to get thrown under the bus for using restraint? Um, are there difficulties with parents? I know many teachers that are, and by the way, this is no slight to parents of children with disabilities. They deal with very difficult things, and I understand this, but I, I do know that there are some staff that are absolutely terrified of the parents and what they'll do, and who they'll complain to, and what kind of trouble they'll get into. So I'd like to know what the culture is like at the school. Like, how do people feel about restraint? Do they feel it's evil? Do they feel it's a necessary evil? Or do they feel that it's a necessary good tool? You know, where do they, where do they fall on, along that? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And people fall in different places along that uh, continuum. So, because the thing is, if the culture is not right for it, everything's going to go to hell. You know, if the culture is one of, we'll tolerate it. I don't like it. I don't like restraint, but we'll tolerate it. Well, if you really don't like it, you're kind of against it. You already have bias. There's probably a greater chance you're going to throw your staff under the bus for using it because you, the administrator, thought it really wasn't necessary. You know, or do you support your staff and say, hey, thank you for keeping this child safe and our other staff safe and for keeping yourself safe because you're a valued employee. And I'm going to support you in that you used it. And if the parents have a problem, they're coming to me. Okay. And I'll, I'll take everything they say with a grain of salt. I'll talk with you first, but I'm going to support you and not throw you under the bus. And if anybody goes under the bus, it's going to be me because I'm the administrator, you know, and if that was the culture, I'd feel pretty comfortable working there, right? The other one is, do they have the resources for the particular children? So some places are very well staffed with a lot of staff. Um, are all the staff useful? You know, are they just bodies in the room generating heat and taking up space? Or are they all good and useful and contribute when there's a crisis? So I think I'd look for some of those things. All right, that's helpful. You know, going, going in. The other one I'd look at, and Matt, if, if she wants it, I just developed a very small PowerPoint presentation on the concept of dangerousness. Um, and I call it the danger zone, which is a archer joke for people that follow the show. Uh, but um, it, it has to do with having a way of categorizing people in different quadrants as to what kind of dangerousness they are. And basically what it is, the most dangerous people have one, a hair trigger, which means there are a number of antecedent stimuli that will set them off. And they are far more sensitive to typical aversives than the average person. One, so they have like a hair trigger. Two, 
they have a tremendous ability to hurt people. They are very skilled at aggression, right? They know how to bite. They know how to kick. They know how to punch. They know how to make a fist. They know how to target areas, right? Um, some people are very good at aggression. Some people are very sloppy with it. They hit with an open hand. They're trying hard, but they're not very dangerous in that regard. Other people could break your nose. So one issue is how dangerous are the people that are being served there? Because I know some schools, some of the kids are pretty dangerous. Some of them have severe behavior problems, but in terms of the damage they can produce to others, they're not that dangerous, right? So, you know, I'd want to know about how many truly, in the way I just described it, dangerous people do you have here? That is, they have very good skills at hurting people. They have hurt people, maybe requiring minor medical assistance, right? And they also have a hair trigger, right? How many of those do you have? And if they say, oh boy, we got a bunch of those, Okay, I'm a little concerned now. So, does that help? Yeah, that's, you know, that that's, kind of that's a lot of, lot of food for thought. Thanks, Alyssa. Um, all right. So, I think we're going to turn the page from the schools uh, for a second. Um, Abby writes in, I'd love to know Dr. Winston's thoughts on the use of restraint in the emergency department of hospitals. Unfortunately, many children with ASD are sent to the ER when behaviors become unsafe uh, in group homes and other types of settings. Um uh, this also warrants a larger discussion on the broken system as the emergency department is not set up to manage challenging behaviors. We get that. But, uh, you know, so um, uh, what, what, what's your, I guess, um, uh, ha- have you see- come across this yourself where people are, are being brought to the emergency room when they're engaging in challenging behaviors? Uh, and do you have um, any thoughts as it, it regards to what might be some, some effective practices under those circumstances? Well, I, I, I don't know what the effective practices are, but when, you know, in Florida, we call it the Baker Act. And for anybody, usually it's done for children that are higher functioning. But whenever they become like a danger to self or others and they can't contain them, they can Baker Act them under like a mental health guideline. And the police come and arrest them and bring them to a uh, outpatient. No, I'm sorry, like an inpatient facility short term. One day, two days, they stay there, they adjust their meds, they usually come out on more meds, um, but uh, that's, that's something that, that would be done. But I think in emergency situations, most places are just going to use mechanical restraint. Most, I, I think probably most hospital staff are not trained in a formal system, but they have orderlies and they have strong arm people and they have sometimes law enforcement and security and they usually they're going to end up doing some form of mechanical bed restraint yeah some sort of posy uh, leather they, posy cuff or something yeah, like that yeah they're going to yeah they're going to do something like that they're um they're geared for it the thing is that they they probably are not going to end up doing the kinds of restraint that we're doing and i think that one of the reasons wow. is um, I work with people who work with the most severely challenged people probably in the world, um, and that's one of the reasons they use our system. And they might have to spend – for you know when they're, before they get fully into treatment and before they figure the person out, they might have to spend hours with the person in restraint. Okay, Most hospital staff, they can't stay with a patient for hours, so they're going to use mechanical restraint. Um, Probably some chemical restraint as well. Probably chemical sedations as well. Now, for us and our colleagues, we can't use chemical sedations. Most places can't use mechanical, so we kind of have to use that. In medical facilities, my feeling is they're not going to want to use manual restraint. They're not geared towards it. They're not geared for it. Uh, They don't have people with the physicality for it either in many instances. Yeah. Um, So, yeah, they're probably just going to do mechanical and chemical. All right, good points. All right, so Meg writes in, I have always struggled with using restraint when managing attention-maintained behaviors. Uh, I rarely use holds, uh, but I do wonder how the attention from the physical hold could be maintaining the unwanted behavior. With that said, does Dr. Winston have any suggestions or uh, restraint alternatives given that attention cannot be removed under these circumstances? Uh, I most certainly do. One, attention is not a single thing. I prefer to call it human-produced stimuli. So let's forget about attention for a moment. Let's talk about human produced stimuli. Um, When someone goes into, you know, uh, children like all kinds of human produced stimuli. Sometimes it is eye contact. Sometimes it is physical contact. Sometimes it is observing a particular facial expression. Okay. Or uh, sometimes it's all these things together. Right. Um, And so the thing is, 
if you define attention as any human produced stimuli as a consequence of the behavior of another person, then it is impossible to withhold attention um, during a restraint. Now, one issue, though, however, is, and this comes up a lot. I, I, let me. I, this is for the for the for the listener with her uh, question. Um, what was her name again? I'm sorry. Meg. Meg. So, <laughs> um, I only laugh because I'm a Family Guy fan, and oh. I just you know, <laughs> yeah, I just had to resist the urge to say shut up, Meg. Uh, but um, which you get if you uh, watch Family Guy. But Meg. Uh, so yeah, what um, one of the. Uh, um, God, I mean, I just lost my train of thought. What are we on again? What human produced again? attention. Right. Human, human right, produced stimuli. So here's one of the things. I get, Meg, I get questions like, Meryl, we think restraint is a reinforcer for this kiddo. Okay. Let's take that phrase apart. Um, here's, here, they suspect, and here's what I say. There may be something related to the restraint in terms of what stopped happening and what is now happening. And there's a no, as I mentioned earlier, it's not just like now I'm getting attention. A whole bunch of things have changed. And I said any number of them could be a contributing variable in maintaining the behavior of the child. But when they say that, uh, you, first of all, it's not been – most of the people who suspect it have not already demonstrated this empirically, that the restraint is functioning as a reinforcer or that the attention generated during restraint is qualitatively different than the attention generated during other times. Now, it's possible that it's true, but very few people demonstrate this empirically. It's usually uh, a hypothesis. It's not an unreasonable one, but it's not necessarily accurate just because they made it. So the kid – there's different things. Some children primarily want to injure you. Some children primarily want to struggle, and they like it, and they think it's fun, and they want to keep the struggle going for as long as they can. They don't care about injuring you. They just like maintaining all the struggle, right? And, it's, and remember, it's a different sort of attention. So, you know, even if you're giving the kid attention all day long, uh, people even say this one, Matt. Uh, he has autism, Meryl, so I think he likes the deep pressure. Oh, okay. Right. I'm surprised that hey, didn't come. Well, I, I'm not surprised well, it didn't come up it given should, our given, but, given our community, but, but I, I hear know, that in the lay population it, all yeah, the time. Yeah, but hey, okay, look, you know, everybody likes a little deep pressure now and then. That's why there's so many massage therapists. Okay, children with autism don't own uh, liking deep pressure. All right, now it could be, but if that were the case then when they do the appropriate behavior, teach them demand for squeezes. And by the way, a lot of BAs do this. And for some kids who truly did just want a big squeeze, that's all they needed. And it was fine, right? For most of the kids that I've interacted with, though, and consulted on, when they say that I think he likes the restraint, he doesn't like it like you like chocolate ice cream. That is, if given here, – here's one of the issues – Anytime any behavior analyst out there suspects that a child may like restraint, and they may, here's what I want you to do. You have to ask yourself, what else is concurrently available that can be produced instantly? So as an example, even though you say he may like the attention from restraint or he may like the restraint or like some aspect of the restraint, if, you, if they love chocolate ice cream and you said, okay, Matt. You can have one of two things. You can have this chocolate ice cream or we can restrain you. What do you want? Ice cream. He's, he's probably not going to pick restraint. Now, what if there's no chocolate ice cream available? Your nearest reinforcer is 20 minutes away and there's absolutely nothing going on in terms of reinforcement. Right now, you're just expected to do work. Well, in that case, restraint starts looking pretty attractive because there is no concurrently available competing reinforcer, right? So – does he like restraint in the sense of he likes chocolate ice cream and money and video games? Probably not. But in the context of it's the only game in town and I can reliably get the attention and interact with three people whenever I want it. It's 100 percent reliable. I can completely control it whenever I want. It may not be the best reinforcer in the world, but it sure is certain. Right. So in some cases, that's what's going on. So what I would say is um, if they suspect that some aspect of attention is maintaining the restraint, then that would suggest that if they're getting enough attention in the out of restraint times, it shouldn't be an issue. Now, if they're normally getting a ton of attention and then you still think that the restraint is functioning somehow 
there's human-produced stimuli, then you have to start investigating what are the stimuli being produced by the humans, okay? Is it your facial expression? Do you look angry? Do you look upset? Um, you know, what's, what's going on? What are the stimuli specifically? Don't say attention. It's too confusing, right? right? Be specific when you're doing it to the behavior analyst and say specifically what stimuli are coming out of staff that you suspect are the most potent variables. And then let's go from there um, is, is what I prefer to say. The other thing as far as minimization, no talking, no eye contact. Don't look at the person. Don't tell them they're doing better. Don't tell them they're doing worse. Don't say, ow, that hurts me. Don't say anything. In our system, our feedback is physical. So as the person begins to escalate, we change our physical prompt. If they de-escalate, and they um, are a little bit less resistive, within three seconds, we hold them less resistively. So it's a negative reinforcement paradigm, which doesn't hold for everybody, of course. But basically what happens is, if you're calmer, we hold more loosely. If you're more agitated, we hold you more tightly. In real time, changing in real time as you change, right? So because of that, we don't need to tell people, okay, Johnny, you're doing better now. You're almost calm. We don't do any of that. Actions speak louder than words. And in this case, that's what we're doing. We're doing physical prompts, physical stimuli yeah. as a consequence of relaxing. So it helps remove facial attention, uh, verbal attention. Like So the stimuli, eye contact, facial expressions, verbal stimuli, we get rid of all those. We don't look at the person. We don't make eye contact. And so the stimuli that are produced by us, the primary ones, they're pressure-based. Have you ever explored the use of a verbally stated rule when you're about to fully release someone from a protective no, hold? No, no, we haven't. And what you can do is I can, you, can always, you can always try it, right? Um, and for some people, they will. They'll say, here's the contingency. The contingency is lie still and we'll let go of you in three seconds and we'll have you standing up within 12 seconds. That's what the rule is. What I tell staff is for someone who can benefit and has been demonstrated – it has been demonstrated that they follow rules given to them at a time when they are physiologically aroused. So I give you a rule when you're calm and you have a history of even when you're physiologically aroused, agitated in some manner, you can still follow the rule. Now, for someone with that history, it's a reasonable, it's a reasonable attempt to say to them in the middle of the restraint, the second you relax, we're going to let go of you in three seconds. And then maybe it will control their behavior. For the average person, I, I think it will not. Okay. And here's what we tell them. When the person is in stable functioning, explain the entire procedure and how it works. Um, Matt, we have video of all our procedures. We even tell staff, you got a high-functioning kid? If you think he can benefit from him, sit down with him, show him the procedure, and explain to him, Johnny, if you ever get in this position because of your behavior and we have to make you safe – just go limp, pretend you're asleep, just completely relax, go like jello. Can you show me loose? And the kid goes, Ugh. good, that's loose. If you ever find yourself here, go loose. Staff have to let you up in three seconds. What's the rule? They say it back to us. And you do that every day at the beginning of the day. Here's my feeling. If you did enough pre-corrective prompting with the child, show them the video, explain to them how it works, they can explain it back. You explaining it to them a 57th time in the middle of a procedure will probably not be that effective Got or it. needed. That makes Does that make sense? sense? That makes a lot of sense. So, yeah. So that's what I usually suggest in, in terms of those kinds of things. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks, Meg. Uh, all right. Naomi uh, writes in, uh, I wonder if Dr. Winston could give advice in terms of achieving staff buy-in to non-restrictive reactive strategies. Uh, such as strategic capitulation and stimulus change, I found it difficult to get staff teams uh, to get on board with doing something silly or out of the blue to momentarily reduce the EO for challenging behavior. So I guess before we ask your advice on getting buy-in for this, perhaps another question would be, you know, uh, do you see the, have you seen these be effective before? And, and should, in, a, in other words, should it be something we get by, we, okay. <laughs> we look to get buy-in for? Okay. Um, this is an, this is an issue of antecedent manipulations and altering motivations. Okay. Um, you know, sometimes you can do this and sometimes you can't. Um, there are times for this capitulation that is, um, uh, let me, let me explain it this way. Um, regarding de-escalating somebody by giving them what they want. I've done this many times, once or twice with the person. 
if it becomes an everyday event, now you are building a monster. So there is a difference between, and this is a very important distinction, between stabilization and clinical treatment. In stabilization, as far as I'm concerned, there are no rules just right. It's like the Outback State House, right. State House okay? No rules just right. So as far as stabilization goes, if you have somebody that does not like hearing the word no, then we do the yes, but strategy or the yes, as soon as, right? So, hey, can I have candy? Sure, buddy. As soon as we get the van, we're all going to the store and you get whatever candy you want. Okay, that's a little Jedi mind trick that people use. It can be very effective. Here's the issue, though. I've done this before. And you know what the staff said to me? Dr. Winston, I'm not a behavior analyst. You know, I've had kids, but it seems to me he needs to learn no. And I said, Miss Thomas, you are exactly correct. He does need to learn no, but he's not quite ready for it yet. Not what I call a hard no. A hard no is like no and no additional information. Hey, can I have some juice? Nope. Bye. <laughs> I like that. That would that would be. Uh, so, and the reason you're laughing is because like you would really hate that. Like if you were at a <laughs> store and you said, um, you know, are do you guys have any of the large screen TVs left? And they go, no. And they said nothing else afterwards, you'd probably be angry. You're expecting, <laughs> no, sir, but we're expecting more in soon. Would you like me to put your name on a mailing list? You know, that you're expecting something like that. They're, they're going to let you down easy, right? A hard no can be very difficult. So what I told the staff is, you are correct. I'm glad you liked that, I'm Matt. Sorry, that is really good. <laughs> nope. Um, but, <laughs> nope. Um, that, and by the way, we do that. I've done that with some of the people clinically to prepare them for people being rude to them. So like we, at first you start with you, um, you know, it's fine for stabilization to say yes as soon as. You can't do that forever. Somebody's eventually gonna say no, and then they're gonna have a major crisis. So the way I get buy-in from the staff is this. For now, we're not gonna say no, we're gonna say yes but, right? Or yes as soon as. As soon as he stabilizes with yes as soon as, and everything's smooth, then we're going to crank it up a little, and then we're going to say a tiny no quietly and then give them the rest of the information. So you start with like, sure, as soon as we get the van, we'll go to the store. Then we do this. No, we got to get the van first, but then we're going to do it. And then you go, no, nah, we got to get the van. And then the next day it's like, what? OK, <laughs> when they ask you um, and then eventually they can just handle no way ever. OK, <laughs> and but that's something my point is, that's something that you would have to work up to. But that would be the clinical goal. So the thing is, as a clinician and to get buy in from the staff, I want to explain to them we're going to do something that is silly and not maintainable. It's not sustainable. It is not sustainable and it's not treatment and it is good for them in the short term and bad for them in the long term. You, staff member, are correct. However, we have to prepare him for the difficult stuff. And the way we're going to do that is get him stable, get him used to everything, capitulate a little bit, and then we're slowly going to amp it up like Errol is teaching. And if we're lucky and skillful, we may be able to get them all the way to a hard no with no crisis or maybe a few. Who knows? But that's how I would try to get buy in from staff by telling them that you're correct. This is not sustainable. You're correct. This is not the way the real world works. OK, but this is just stabilization. We're going to change tactics and do what, you know, and I know needs to be done. That's going to be a little bit more difficult. That's that's how I like to try to get it from them. Cool, cool. You know, let them know. Let them know you're not crazy for thinking this is a stupid thing to do. Yeah, they're, they're, it, it has downsides and it's limited. Um, yeah. Okay. All right. Cool. Well, I promised that we would return to restraint reduction goals. Oh, great. Um, so let's uh, let's uh, wind things down or up or whatever uh, uh, with uh, with with that topic, and then uh, we'll call it a day. Okay, so um, the short version is restraint reduction goals are awful. Stop making them. That's the short version. You mean goals in like an IEP or an IHP or something like that? A goal in anything to reduce restraint is a bad idea because it misfocuses the entire population. So um, 
a lot of the reasons that administrators like to get restraint reduction goals is because they are handed these goals from higher on. OK, and then they must comply with them. It's not necessarily the administrator's idea, but it's a bad idea. And here's why I can show you a thousand and one ways to reduce restraints that not only don't help the child, but are actually clinically counterproductive. I could show you a thousand and one ways. OK, mm -hmm. and I will get your restraint rates way down, but it will not be to the client's benefit. It's, okay. It reminds me of what the behavioral safety folks will say in terms of don't have a goal of reducing injuries because you're just going to get people fudging the numbers and, and not, oh, wrap, uh, not wrap reporting. Wrap them up in bubble wrap. Yeah. Wrap them up in bubble wrap. Right, or not reporting, and then they get or really hurt. And, right. Yeah. So here's the issue. I can give you a dec I can give my school a decree that says restraints shall be reduced. I don't care how you do it, just do it. Well, you be careful what you ask for in that case. Now, the thing is, administrators feel good about that because they can give them a solid goal. I want you to stop doing this. Here's the problem. People can't say this because they can't guarantee it's going to happen. Um, I want all people to learn uh, a functional replacement skill. Uh, I want to see this increase 200%. Well, you can't guarantee that. People learn at different rates. Some people are great teachers. Some people are poor teachers. It doesn't happen as easily as a mandate to stop doing things. A mandate to start doing things, I want to see everyone here with a quality behavior plan written by a competent behavior analyst who trained our staff and did follow-up, okay? And I want to see this increase. So my whole thing is, Restraint reduction goals allow too many ways to reduce restraints that are counterproductive and not helping the child. A goal of learning new skills, that will automatically, if you teach the right skills, a goal of arranging environments, doing staff training, making curriculum adjustments, teaching new skills. If you do those things, restraints reduce by themselves. You don't need an active goal to suppress restraint. You need an active goal to increase all those skills that will result in a decrease in restraint naturally. So, what, and here's another issue with restraint reduction goals. We could get a 50% reduction in our restraint, and everybody could be giving us kudos. I could accept two children to the school with very severe behavior problems. Immediately, our restraint doubles. Are we doing a great job or a horrible job? Well, if you go by the numbers, we're suddenly doing a horrible job again. Now, if you do this, if I were the principal of a school, I would be doing this. I'm not going to have a restraint reduction goal. I'm going to have a goal for the number of children that come in here with behavior problems that can then go to a less restrictive setting. And I'm going to see how long it takes us to get each child through. And that's going to be our goal is to get 10 children who come into our program with behavior problems out of our program and ready for the next less restrictive placement within one year. That's my goal. I don't care about restraints because if we can meet that goal, those kids will not have restraints anymore. You understand? Mm -hmm. So it's the focus on restraint reduction. It, it's a, it's a dangerous misfocus. The focus should be is the focus should be on this. Why are we not getting and sustaining meaningful behavior change? Why? How, how about a goal for obtaining and sustaining meaningful behavior change for each student. And if you did that, restraint is far, so much less of an issue. And if they were really doing a good job with it, like I said, restraint just falls away on its own. You don't need to suppress it. You don't need to actively reduce it. Uh, All right, cool. Um, well, that is uh, an informative uh Episode number two, Meryl. Thanks for coming back. We've uh, gone you're, through you're almost two welcome. hours, so this is getting like Joe yeah, Rogan right? level, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> or at least length. Uh, I was just so. getting warmed up. That's right. <laughs> uh, no, no, I'm I'm tired. Uh, but no, I I know we covered a lot. Those of you that didn't get uh, any of your questions answered, uh, if you're on the confessions group uh, or any other group. If you just like contact me through Facebook or Facebook Messenger, if you have a specific question, I'll be happy to answer it for you. Yeah, and but, uh, can uh, we? Yeah, go ahead. The uh, danger zone PowerPoint. Uh, I, danger if, zone. That's right. <laughs> um, 
I just go right to Kenny Loggins, not the uh, not the, not the, Archer, not Arch, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, but um, uh, if we could link that in the show notes, if I can, if you if you can zip that I'll to send me, it I to can, you. yeah, that yeah. way if people want that. They can uh, they can right. grab that from the show notes. And, as well. and by the way, guys, this is just like so many things. It's a conceptual thing. It's something I made up, but it's something that will allow you to have a more meaningful discussion about what do you mean by dangerous. And yeah. at least you can start thinking about it a little bit more detailed now. Yeah, it's an analytic tool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, or at least that's a, all a, something for to prompt some thunk, th- some some thinking. So, yes. all right, Dr. Merrill Winston, thanks for joining me again. And thanks uh, again, Matt. All right, take care. Thank you for listening to the Behavioral Observations Podcast with Matt Sicoria. You can find Matt's notes on this episode at www.behavioralobservations.com. We also invite you to stay connected with us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash behavioral observations and on Twitter at Behavior Podcast.